Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So Britain is being put to the test. Your data suggests you have a strong preference for white individuals. You look really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People are going undercover to find out how widespread racism is. I'll be putting myself to the test to find out about my own prejudices. Uh, yeah, I did well. Yes. And I'll confront people who feel I'm not really as British as they are, even though I was born here. But I am English. All people have a native homeland. My native homeland is here. I was it's born here. Not... I'm a data journalist. I normally rely on numbers to get to the truth behind complicated stories. But when it comes to racism, I don't think numbers alone are enough. I need to find out what's happening firsthand for myself. When you say the word racist, this is what lots of people might imagine. People have accused the English Defence League of racism since they were created back in 2009. Is that fair? Do they think they're racists? I'm joining the ADL today for a demonstration, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say. Um, and I'm waiting to meet some of the people in the pub there before we kind of head off. How comes your face is covered? Because the, that stigma that's attached. And what's the stigma? We tend, we get called racist. We get called far right. Um, Do you think that's fair? Or? No, not at no. all. I'm half Greek Cypriot, so I'm not racist. My family are immigrants, so not a chance. But a lot of people won't accept that I'm just here to fight radical Islam. The trouble is with this country, you can't tell the truth. I have to cover my face because otherwise I could lose my job. In a survey, almost 70% of Brits said they have no racial prejudices at all. And everyone I spoke to here has said they're not racist. <laughs> Lots of people are keen to talk, but some really don't want us here. What are you filming for? Are you filming? I said, don't tell me you're a friend. You're famous, you left with mum. About 500 people from across Britain have come to today's demonstration. They say they're not racist, but as someone who isn't white and who comes from a Muslim family, I feel really uncomfortable here. to West Midlands, the heart of England. This is our England, we'll stay our England, and while ever Midlands, Yorkshire, North East exists, and all the rest down South, England will be loud, proud, and always defended by the English Defence League to fight this problem, this virus, and this disease of Islam. All of them can kiss my little white ass. Just after the speeches begin, one of the crowd singles me out and starts hassling me. Details is 2009. That is six years of hiding the facts of what is going on. Things quickly get out of hand. Now here I come. Why don't go and watch the mark? Now here I come. Because what you've got. Because there are Mohammedans and they are following the dictators. Right, 
Up until now, it was just what people were saying that made me feel uncomfortable. But now that it's getting physical, I feel like it's time to leave. Oh, it's like, as soon as you walk out of there, you feel like a little bit of, like, tension leave your chest. I feel animosity. They can say what they like about, like, you know, being open-minded and stuff. You can feel animosity. You can feel when the camera is off looking at something else, someone kind of eyeing you up and down. I felt completely uncomfortable from start to finish. Some of the people at that EDL event did seem racist to me, but they don't see themselves that way, so they wouldn't show up on any survey about prejudice. And that's just one of the problems when it comes to figures on racism in Britain. For example, the number of us who say we aren't prejudiced has stayed pretty much the same over the past decade. But reports of hate attacks, motivated by race, religion, or both, have risen dramatically against some communities. Keep doing the fucking country, oh. get a black bastard. Whatever you do, man. Bang out. Sorry. What? So, it looks like the numbers aren't giving us a proper picture of what's happening on the streets. Is aggressive racism common in Britain? Three people are going undercover to find out. The common assumption of Muslims at the moment is that they're all terrorists, that all the men are terrorists and that all the wives are at home feeding the terrorists. I think that Britain as a, as a nation is conservative about its racial prejudice in the sense that it's not going to tell you to your face that they're racist. As part of my faith, I wear a kippah, or a yarmulke, which is a head covering, acknowledging that there is a greater presence out there, um, respect for God. Uh, and that obviously means that I'm more identifiably Jewish. I might occasionally get uh, a stare or somebody holding my eye line a bit longer when I'm walking on the street than I'm comfortable with. Richard, Hannah and Deji will film for a day with hidden cameras as they walk around minding their own business. They're going to places where there have been some racial tensions, but if the police figures are right, then it's really unlikely that anything will happen to any one of them in a single day. Because while there were 39,000 hate crimes motivated by race or religion recorded last year, that was spread out across a population of 64 million people. This is Dudley. About one in 25 people that live here are Muslim, just over the national average. Plans for a new mosque have inflamed tensions and there have been reports of problems between the white and Muslim people in this community. This is where Hannah will be spending a day. I'm feeling nervous. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure what to expect. Uh, yeah, I got a pull. Yeah, I am. Hi. Um, is there anywhere where I could sit down and eat around here? Uh, you've got McDonald's at the top of the road, and then okay. turn right uh, to the lights just over, and you'll see it. OK, that's, that's the fine. Thing, oh, thank you. Um, can I have a barbecue dip, please? Yeah. Ketchup. Ketchup on the bottom. Can we come and sit here? Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. That's all right. I'll be leaving soon anyway, so it's fine. Oh, <laughs> Um, well, this morning I was quite surprised. I was um, expecting, you know, some sort of reaction or a lot of stares. I did get quite a few stares compared to, you know, London, for example, where I wouldn't get any stares. So people did look at me and things like that, but no one said anything. 
But according to community groups, it's women wearing full face veils that are targeted most aggressively in attacks. So, Hannah will spend the rest of the day wearing the niqab to see if it changes how she's treated. Within 10 or 15 minutes of walking around the niqab, a car drove past with two guys in it, and one of them shouted something at me from the window. It was very intimidating, and it was quite scary because I was walking by myself, and, you know, I'm not familiar with the area, and I have no idea who they are, and they don't know who I am. An anti-hate crime group found that 60% of attacks against Muslims are perpetrated against women. 10 to 15 minutes after that incident, another car drove by with one guy in it. It was just quite scary that someone could be so fearless, as if you know, nothing stops them from scaring me. I felt quite powerless and intimidated. It makes me feel quite sad. You know, it's not like these men were children, that they, you know, are just sort of young children who don't know much, that they're adults. So the fact that they've chosen to hurl abuse at a random stranger just makes you feel quite hopeless. I mean, what, what, what can you do about that? This is Somerset. Only two in a thousand people that live here are black. We've been told by anti-racism groups that there are issues here. This is where Deji will be spending his day. I'm hoping it's going to be a positive and pleasant experience, um, but you just never know. So um, let's see what happens. actually because um, a couple of times people have, have seen me and, and said hello and how are you which was great and then I just come from a pub now where I was standing outside and the three blokes that were there offered me a seat to sit down. I thought I'd get a bit of sun before, no, no, before it's all gone for the summer you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's gone in it yeah. yeah, yeah. This is our summer. Yeah. They noticed that I'm not from around here and they were just talking to me and getting me involved, which was nice, because it's quite a small pub. And I'm always quite conscious of small pubs because they tend to be quite local. You know, it seems to be the same people going there. So the fact that they could tell I was new, but I didn't, they, I wasn't made to feel uncomfortable in terms of those three guys. But what I have also noticed is that there is the ones who are not speaking, you, I do get the, the look. So they're just giving me, you know, just little, they're staring at me or there's a little look there. You know, I, I try and acknowledge them. I, I try and smile, you know, whatever. But yeah, I do feel that like there's a couple of looks, but uh, nothing to make me feel so awkward that I have to, I have to leave or, or get out of the area. And so I go home happy. This is Bradford. Nearly a quarter of the 500,000 people that live here are Muslims. And just 300 Jewish people live here. It's been said that wars in the Middle East have created tensions between these two communities here in Britain, including Bradford. This is where Richard is going to spend his day. Hopefully as we walk the streets, good people of Bradford will just pay me as little attention as, uh, as everyone else does back at home. My gut instinct, I suppose, being an optimist, is that nothing at all will happen. Uh, potentially people might see that I'm wearing a kippah, 
uh, might want to ask a few questions about what does that mean or are you Jewish? Within about 60 seconds of getting out of the station, I was walking past a small group of people who were having a drink outside a pub. Down. <laughs> there you go, good spot there. You've got a good spot there. Oh, yeah. Charlie Taylor, a good friend, a very good looking lady, a good fight. That's all we're talking about, Mike. You're a friend. Look at that, enjoy. Thank you, Philip. Have a good day. You too, mate. Be careful, you left legs. What? That was close, wasn't it, sweetheart? Too close for comfort to me. Oh, will you shut the fuck up? It was certainly bizarre. I'm not quite sure what they meant by that. But for most of the day, it was very pleasant. Excuse me. Sorry, you don't know where Centenary Square is? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. Everybody was lovely. Uh, when I clearly looked lost, a number of people came up to me. That's all really cool. Yeah, that's sure down. Yeah, that's sort of something on it. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much. Have a good day. Unfortunately, in the last hour or so, we actually ended up taking the wrong direction down the dodgy alley. Sorry. No. Two white guys saw me and said, oh, can I just borrow your phone? I just need to make one phone call. And I politely declined. And as I was walking past, they shouted, oh, it's a Jew. It's really striking that that can be a term of insult. And then really not long after that, walking along this time, actually a very busy main road, and a young Asian male was driving past me. He knocked on his window and gave me the V-sign. Five minutes later, a similar thing happened. Another British Asian male was driving past on a different stretch of the road. And again, banged on his window and gestured to me. Hello. Cheers, guys. That's actually quite depressing. Um, I really wanted to be right. I need to be careful not to draw huge generalisations of what clearly was just one day in one city, um, one particular year, uh, but nevertheless it happened. Um, and I can't pretend it didn't. It's just wrong, it's just not right. Um, it's just not right to behave that way. It looks like aggressive racism is alive and well in Britain. The undercover experiment reflects the increase in reports of religiously motivated hate crime. Sources suggest 50% more attacks on Jewish people across Britain in the first half of this year, and 70% more against Muslims in London last year. The abuse that was held at Hannah would technically have been recorded as a race hate crime, but she says that she wouldn't have reported it. And I know that for me personally, when I've received verbal abuse or even been punched, I didn't go to the police. So the official statistics probably don't capture the full extent of what's happening on the streets of Britain. But what about more subtle ways we might treat people differently because of their race or religion? Is it possible to detect them? Let's start with a simple test. Richard, Deji, Hannah, and Hannah and Inna Cobb will hand out a dozen donuts to the public as quickly as possible. This test clearly is not scientific, but will people on the street be less likely to take food from any of them? Free donut. No, I think it's always good to diversify your career opportunities, so going into a bit of sales work is always going to be a bit of fun. I'm being honest with you, I'm not really feeling this flag. You know, it's affecting my whole swagger. I'm losing all, all street credibility here. I think I will get quite a bit of attention just because, um, you know, I'm someone who's wearing a scarf with a few donuts. I'm quite nervous about uh, speaking to people within a car bond. Free donut. Oh, 
I'm kidding. Don't know what that's supposed to mean. Is that a free donut? Free donuts, yes. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I think someone just walked past and muttered scum under their breath um, towards me, which um, <laughs> is quite shocking that someone would disrespect a stranger like that. So far, it's been Hannah and Richard that have run into problems in the tests. But Deji has also faced racism on Britain's streets. I had eggs chucked from a moving vehicle, just missing me. The odd monkey chant. I had uh, people saying, you know, fuck off, get back, go back to your own country. You know, fucking get out of here. And that's not nice. Imagine, you know, I've grown up in... England all my life. So when you're when you're being told fuck off back to your country, I'm like, where do you want me to go? <laughs> this is my country. Prejudice against black people is still a serious issue across Britain. This is Osset, a traditional market town that's 98% white. Martha Renee faced abuse when she opened her cafe here. It's been four years, going to five now, since we started the cafe. It's been really tough, but I keep coming here because that's what I like to do. It means so much to me. I'm very passionate about it. Well, also, it's a beautiful place. We've got some nice people here who've been really kind to me. Since I came in, and there have been some people who've been really horrible as well, you know. It's both in the ends of the spectrum, the highest being. They've called me black bitch. They've called me effing paki and effing nigger. They've called me those names. As well as the name calling, Martha was troubled by what she believes was unspoken prejudice. People would say the food's good. Then why are they not coming in? I mean, why would someone come? and put their face to the window like that to stare at us. Or maybe they will come in, can I have a medium breakfast? And I will cook the breakfast and maybe they will eat everything on the plate and leave a slice of toast, so I can't pay for this, it was too greasy. What do you say to people like that? What do you say? I mean, I leave home and I'm so excited. I will come and I will cook, I will do everything I mean, you see how clean this place is. I will clean it over and over. But they will go and say, oh, that place is dead, we can't go there. Martha decided to deal with the situation by putting up a sign at her cafe. Well, it says, attention, everyone be aware. I am a black woman and always will be. If you are allergic to black people, don't come in. But if you prefer quality, wholesome meals in a pleasant and clean environment, come in. I don't bite. Thanks, Martha Renee. I, I put the sun up because we came to work one morning, my daughter and I, and two white women walked in. They looked at my daughter up and down, staring at her, turned around and said, we are in the wrong place. If they were in the wrong place, they would have said, oh, sorry, love. We're looking for another shop. The mannerism spoke it all. 
and it worked out, and it really upset my daughter and myself. So I put the sound out. That way, when they see the sound, if they don't like black people, they won't come in. It's impossible to prove whether Martha was treated differently because of her race. The problem is, unspoken racism is hard to verify. Can a test help identify unconscious prejudice? Richard, Hannah and Deji will trigger 10 shop alarms to see whether any one of them gets their bags searched more often. suspicion in a sense that someone's thinking, oh, this boy might nick something. I think because I'm coded as white, as many Jews are, I'm probably treated with any implicit assumptions that that might bring. That one, I'm pretty sure. What's up, man? Yeah. Open my bag. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a problem. Yeah, it's all right. Security, are you? Alright. Do you know what I mean? Can I open your bag up then for me? No, just um. It's never a nice feeling. No one likes to feel like they might be perceived as someone suspicious. Have you bought anything? No, I haven't bought anything. Do you mind if I just try your bag? It's alright. Yeah, sure, mate. Sure. Let's say I'm in the shop, then you might see the security do a little manoeuvre. You know, they do a manoeuvre, which is they, they are on... They tend to kind of stand at the edge of the aisle of where you are, and they kind of do a little glance here and there. Do you know what I mean? I, I noticed that. When it comes to crime, it's often black people that are viewed with the most suspicion. In some areas, you're 17 times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're black. Compared to white people, black people get longer prison sentences on average and are nearly twice as likely to be charged if caught with drugs. No one said anything even remotely racist to Deji. So it's impossible to know for sure that his bag was searched more often just because he's black. But there is a test that looks at whether we subconsciously view black people differently. I'm going to ask some people in this pub to sit the test. Hello, hi. Um, would you be willing to do a test, but without knowing anything at all about what the test consists of? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Hello. Is there a place sit? Yeah, of course, sit down. All right, so I'll just set it up for you guys. The trick is to be as fast as you can. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
people are shown a quick succession of faces and words. They have to quickly classify each face as black or white and each word as good or bad. This is ridiculous. <laughs> the test detects whether people unconsciously associate a particular race with good or bad words. All right, you're done, you're done, you can breathe. <laughs> so your data suggests a strong automatic preference for white people compared to black people. How do you feel about that? Uh, it's not great, no. Yeah. I wouldn't have said that's the way I view people. Or, um, I'd like to think that I have the same kind of preference for both. You do you have a slight bias towards individuals who are white? Right. Does that surprise you at all? Um, yeah, a little bit. Uh, it doesn't make me feel good. Because, you know, it's not nice to discover that you have that natural instinct. I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm racist at all. I wouldn't think that I would treat someone differently just because of their race. Like, I wouldn't instinctively do that. But then I suppose the test does not show differently. So it's difficult to say. You have no automatic preference between uh, black individuals and white individuals, according to the test. You're happy with the result? Yeah. yeah. Why are you happy with it? Because I don't think I'm a racist person, and that proves it. So it says that your data suggests a slight preference towards black people compared to white people. Mm -hmm. Does that surprise you at all? I don't know. I don't think I really do have a bias, if you know what I mean, like... Right. Back to me now. Thank you very much. So it says that your data suggests you have a strong preference for white individuals over black individuals. <laughs> right. <laughs> A strong automatic preference for white individuals over black individuals. How do you feel about the results? I don't think it's changed my opinion about myself much. Yeah, well, he looked really uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't a test to find racists. It's just about discovering the hidden prejudices we don't even know that we have. So altogether, about 3,000 British people have sent this test, and 80% of those who weren't black showed some preference towards white people. So does that mean there's something deep within many of us that makes us view black people differently? I'm going to put myself through some tests to find out more about my own unconscious prejudices. Today, I've come to have my brain scanned by a scientist who is pioneering research into our hidden attitudes on race. Hello. Morning, hi. Hi, Manos. Manos. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. So, welcome to the MRI unit of Earl Holloway. Uh, we're going to be doing a short experiment, trying to see how your brain responds to faces of people who belong to different races. And can I ask which races I'm going to be showing you? You're going to be seeing white and black faces. No anything else? No, no. Arab faces, no, no Asian faces? No, just white and black. OK. How are you feeling? Um, a little bit nervous. I've never had someone scan my brain before, so this is going to be interesting for me. Hi, Mona, how are you? I'm OK, thanks. OK, we're going to start the experiment. So Monash is going to be looking at different faces appearing on the screen for 1.5 seconds. What we're interested in is her brain response in two key areas. One is an area that codes fear, it shows a fear response, and the second area is the one that tries to control an automatic fear response. And we hope that we will be able to find some differences when she's looking at black faces versus white faces. The scanner measures the blood flowing through my brain to reveal which areas are most active. Hi, Mona. It's all done and it's time to come out. Uh, Ali will come to pick you up. OK. So let me take you through the results. 
Now, first of all, is there any area in your brain that was more active when you were looking at white faces? And the answer is no. So now the question is what happens to your brain when you look at black faces compared to white faces? As you can see, there were three key areas that were more active. The first one is the brain area that we know is involved in fear response. The second brain area is involved in controlling automatic responses, such as a fear response. And finally, the brain area that we know is involved in, in resolving conflicts between different uh, potential responses. So what does this mean then? Does this mean that I'm just afraid of black people? This is a learned response to associate, for example, black individuals with fear. And even if we're not explicitly racist, we have to be aware of the fact that we're all born and raised in societies that may uh, encourage different stereotypes. But at the same time, you find this very positive uh, activation in parts of the brain that try to regulate this automatic response. And this is quite important because at the end of the day, this is what we want. We want to try and go beyond what we've learned and we want to try and control our behavior so that, that we don't behave in a racist uh, way. So do you think if Britain was a less racist society, my brain would look different? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I feel really disappointed. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that all of the stuff that society has said to me, all of this negative stuff has affected my brain. Um, I don't think I was born with an aversion to black people. Uh, and I don't think that I have developed that fear from, through my own personal experiences, because I don't think I've had any more negative personal experiences of black people than I have of any other race. Um, and the thing that's even quite frightening is I'm not even, I still see obviously like, you know, stereotypes being kind of banded around, but I'm not aware of the way that they are constantly affecting me. If anything, I'm thinking, that's, that's not true, that's not true, that's not true, and yet it's somewhere in my brain. But I think it's just quite sad how, how crude it is in a way. Like, it's just the part of your brain saying, be scared. It's just so unbelievably basic. You don't have to look hard to find examples of negative stereotyping of black people. Close to seven in ten stories in the news about young black men relate to crime. While music videos and movies show black men as violent criminals to be feared. Islamist extremists here and abroad have driven some to have a sense of hostility towards all Muslims. And events in the Middle East are sometimes claimed to be behind the rise in attacks on Jewish people here. The sense of injustice that some feel has coincided with the creation of small new political parties. Unfortunately, I think there is racism in Britain and that comes from the top, from the government, the politicians. They hate the white working class and we know this because they're destroying our communities, absolutely obliterating them. Jack is a publicity officer for the political party Liberty GB, who argue that multiculturalism is damaging Britain. Every nation should be culturist. It should allow the national culture to uh, essentially be supreme. Um, and I think it's important for nations to actually maintain um, a population which is majority indigenous. A lot of people are going to have to be deported. Anyone that's come here should have their citizenship scrutinised. Anyone who actually isn't offering anything serious, uh, what's the point in keeping them here? Um, George, have you... Is it done? OK. Why hasn't this... Uh, we're filming some videos for the party. It's, uh, it's something we do um, pretty regularly. It's basically just keep the members updated and um, hopefully some of it goes viral. So it's basically just an internet outreach.
Islam is probably right now the primary problem with multiculturalism. It's fascist, it's authoritarian. I'm not saying don't believe in Allah, don't believe you're a Muslim. What I am saying is don't bring the female genital mutilation, don't bring the fascist ideas. Nigel Farage, this is for you. You told us that multiculturalism has failed, and then your party went out of its way to appease multiculturalists, handering to the vote of the bleeding heart liberals. It's just gonna fail. Your party even had some kind of ridiculous stunt where he embraced people of a huge range of different backgrounds on stage. Multiculturalism and Islam have torn our country apart and created community tensions and ghettos. Jack fears that proposed changes in the law could mean he'll end up in prison for speaking out. I think more people need to just come out and accept the consequences, accept that they might lose the job, accept that they might go to prison or whatever. You've, you've got to talk about these things and you've got to stop it. It's, 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 it's like dissenting in communist Russia. It's, it had to be done. And I'm really proud to be British and, you know, we, we essentially founded Western liberal democracy in many respects. And now we're just losing all of it. Yep. Racism, Islamophobia, all these terms, they mean nothing. It's just a way of shutting people down and stopping the discussion. But you know what, I think me and a hell of a lot of other people have gotten to the point where if you're going to call me a racist, whatever, I don't care. I know I'm not a racist, I know I'm a culturist. Although Jack denies it, his disdain for multiculturalism feels racist to me. But then we're from very different places. I grew up in East London, one of the most diverse areas in Britain. I've asked Jack to meet me here to try and get a better understanding of his views. Hi. Hello. Hi, Jack. Nice Good to meet you. How? Oh, Sorry. it really hurt. It was like a proper strong <laughs> handshake. Anyway, uh, so we are here in Queen's Market, which is in Upton Park. Yeah. Um, which actually isn't too far away from where I grew up. So I've been to this market a fair few times, I have okay. to say. Have you ever been here before? No, no, I haven't, no. no, no. Do you know this area at all? Not at all, no? no. OK, what are your sort of first impressions of here? It's a completely different world. Really? Yeah. A completely different world to what? To the world that you know? To England. It's... No, no, this is definitely England. We're mm. in England right now. Arguably. It doesn't seem like it. Why doesn't it seem like England to you? Well, I see very few English people. The whole place has just been transformed. So when you say that you look around and you see very few English people, mm. how do you know that you might see someone like me and you might not necessarily identify me as English, but I am English? Oh, of course, by nationality, yeah. I was born here. Yes. I'm as English as you are. Yes, but think about it. You know, all, all people have a native homeland. My native homeland is here. No, I was born not. here no, because... No, no, no native my means native natality. Homeland it is... means where you were born, No, right? my native homeland, my historic homeland, is Western Europe. And I'm not saying you're any less British. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But what I am saying is you're not an indigenous British person. It feels like Jack believes my race means I don't belong here as much as him. But I feel every bit as British as he does. I have British values. Mm. My parents immigrated to this country and they have British values, yes. right? Yep. So what you want is Western European ideals, but mm. you're saying I'm not Western European, even though I'm assimilated. Not ethnically, no, 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 no. Culturally, largely so you are, yeah. why do you care about my ethnicity? Why does it mean that me and you are different? No, because when, there's two, because there are two fundamental ways of describing someone who is British, for instance. You're either a Western European ethnically, or you're a Western European in that you've got a passport and you subscribe to the ideals. I'm not just living in Britain. I was born here. Yep. This is my country. Yep. We're getting past the facts here. You're saying, oh, it's horrible for you to point out a fact that I'm not ethnically European. I'm not saying European. it's horrible. I'm saying well, it's so irrelevant. Not? And every single time you do it, it undermines, it undermines my identity. You're saying... Well, that's your think... problem. That's not my problem. Fundamentally, you have different experiences to me, I have different experiences to you. Some people assimilate you, but a significant majority do not. Mm. And yeah, lo lots of Londoners were brought up in this kind of multicultural scenario, which is why so many of them are brainwashed into saying, yes, it's brilliant, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. I'm sorry, the world isn't perfect, it's not. And we try and make it as perfect as possible with our Western ideals, with our freedom and our liberty. So, I I can, I can hear how angry you are, I can hear how frustrated you are, it's very visible. What can we do when we're constantly bombarded as being racist and evil? I'm sorry, I don't hate people because of their race. I look at a real and serious threat and I want to tackle it. So it's been a kind of interesting day with Jack. On the one hand, I actually really do understand why someone who would come from a majority white part of Britain would arrive here and actually have a bit of a culture shock almost to feel really, really out of place. So I guess I can sort of empathise with that. When it comes to his political views, 
I really, really do actually think that he probably doesn't think he's a racist. And I think he thinks all of his views are just about culture and immigration. But actually, when it comes down to it, his insistence, his constant refusal to acknowledge my Western European culture felt pretty racist to me, right? He was more interested in the fact that I'm not white than the fact that I was born here. And that, to me, is incredibly offensive. All the people I've met on this journey, whatever their colour or religion, have felt that racism is an issue in the UK. But does it affect every aspect of our lives? I'm here to find out whether race matters to these people when they're picking a date. You can't wait to see these pictures. You're like, I want to see these women. <laughs> right, we'll start off with this woman. Is this someone who you find attractive? No. No? This woman? No. no. Picky. You're picky? Yes, I like oh, he's all right. Yeah, he's got my beard. What do you think about him? Um, no, I don't think so. No, not for you. Him? No. no. What do you think about her? Yeah, she's cute. You would, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe like one or two dates. No. No. Yeah. OK, so would you say there was any sort of pattern in the sort of women that you were going for there? Yeah, a particular interest towards white women, mixed race women. OK. There were women from different ethnicities that I found attractive. But I'm thinking about who my friends are, yeah. what, what things that I do, because I'm from Nigeria and I'm very connected to that culture. So I'm thinking, is there, is there compatibility there? It's good looking, but I don't think I would go there. No, for me, I've never really thought about dating anybody who's black. I've just it's never come across my mind. And I, I, Even though you are attracted to him, you yeah. think he's attractive? Yeah, yeah, he's attractive. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll always appreciate somebody who's attractive, but being in a big Indian family, you have to sort of think about the wider extension and the network of the family as well. I wouldn't want to bring somebody home that I know my parents would have a real big issue with. Probably not. <laughs> I think culturally and religiously would clash. So I'm, I'm not really religious. I'm not practising. If somebody was like, oh, I'm quite a strong Muslim, their family might not want, want me in their family. I just really don't find them attractive okay. at all. All right, OK. What about him? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. No. I don't see how I could ever be accepted into that community. Um, yeah. But it's like a half-hearted, yeah? Why is it a half-hearted, <laughs> It's yeah? like, just cause naturally, because she's Indian, like subconsciously, you're on tight, yeah. So subconsciously, you're always attracted to Indian women? Yeah, I think, like, regardless of what background you're from, like, you're always going to be attracted to the same race, religion, culture. I actually have never dated a black guy, but he is really good looking. Would it be fair to say that your type tends to be more white, even though you're open-minded about dating people of other races? Well, yeah, probably, because that's been my experience. Because my um, circle of friends doesn't include many black people, I just, I don't come into contact. And I think that being, like, attraction um, comes from a place that is, you know, what you're used to coming in contact with. Love isn't blind when it comes to race. I looked at the behaviour of 25 million users of an online dating site and it was very clear that race matters. See, white men do really well and by that I mean they're more likely to get responses to their messages than black or Asian men. And white women do really well too. And out of all of the groups that I looked at, black women were the least likely to get a response to one of their messages. Race clearly plays a big part in the way we view each other. But are my prejudices fixed for life? I've come back to see Professor Manos Sakiris. He's got an amazing idea which he says can change the way I think. Hello. Hi, Hi Manos. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you again. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, uh, we're going to do an experiment today that has three parts. Yep. In the first part, you're going to do what is known as the implicit association test. Mm -hmm. After that, we're going to do a task uh, which we call self-association. But basically what it involves is you imagining that you're uh, a different person. I'm yeah. going to be a black woman, aren't I? You're going to be a black woman, yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. after that, we're going to give you one more time the IAT. Again, we're going to measure your implicit attitudes towards black and white people. Okay. Mm. 
White face said key, black face M key. Now it's my turn to have my unconscious prejudices examined. Good, bad. All right, I'm done with that bit, Manos. What's next? Excellent. So we can move to the next task. So this is the part where I've got to imagine I'm a black woman. Use this one because I want to. Manos is going it. to use a range of techniques to get me to make this leap. <laughs> In this bizarre setup, my real hand, which I can't see, is being stroked at exactly the same time as the black rubber hand in front of me to trick my brain into thinking that the black rubber hand is mine. So how does it feel? Mm, ticklish. As odd as this seems, it's actually working. It felt like it was my own hand. Yeah. <laughs> Another technique involves me imagining that I'm a black woman pictured on the computer. So I am the black woman, the stranger is the white woman, before the experiment continues, Manos has to check that I really am imagining I'm a black woman. Now, yeah, as you can see, I did well. Yes. So your accuracy was very high for the self-associated phase. So your performance shows that you are very good at imagining that you're this new black person. Mm. OK. Now let's have a look at the IAT. Manos is testing whether my negative associations about black people have changed. I'm skeptical that my deep-rooted beliefs can be shifted so easily. Finished. Excellent. So, shall we have a look at the results? Yes, please. Okay. Did the face association work? So, this is going to be your score before you did the self-association task. What you can see here is a very small preference of white people over black. And now the important thing is how this value changes after you've done the self-association task, after you've imagined that you're this new black woman. And what you find here is that basically this eliminates the preference of white over black people. So I'm pleased by the fact mm -hmm. that this experiment somehow changed me and lessened my racial biases. Yeah. But now I'm like, how long can I keep this up for? Does this mean that for the rest of my life I'm not going to express any kind of preference of white people over black people? Um, I don't think that's right. Uh, <laughs> well, but if I do the, the test answer, every day? No. If you do it every day, <laughs> maybe. The answer is that we don't know. Of course, it's a, it's a very important question. I'd bear in mind that already it is, it is a surprising finding that you can so quickly associate yourself with new things. In that case, you've imagined being a black woman. and your brain very fast take this, take, takes this in, new information into account and you process this information in a very special way. It's really, really interesting. Thank you. It's Thank been you a privilege to be able to take the test. <laughs> I'm slightly relieved that my starting point wasn't that I was a massive racist in terms of having really, really strong associations. So it's quite nice that I had a slight preference towards white people. Slight is better than a lot, I guess. Um, and then I was really, really relieved that the, the experiment managed to sort of erase what those associations are. That's good news, I guess. But the fact that he wasn't able to answer how long that's going to stick around for is sort of worrying. Am I just going to wake up tomorrow morning and just be back to slightly preferring white people over black people? That's not exactly a, a happy result for me, you know? It's amazing that our prejudices, learned over a lifetime, can be shifted so quickly. But for the moment, this is only being done in the lab. It's not being used in the real world. Is Britain racist? The language has changed, but the sentiment hasn't. Rather than someone coming up to you and, and, and saying a negative word or a racist remark, I think it's more underlying. When you say your local area has changed, you don't, it doesn't feel English anymore, doesn't feel British anymore. Where does that come from? And I think they come from something inside, a prejudice that people might have. Being Jewish in Britain is generally a really positive thing. I find that people, by and large, aren't afraid to go to synagogue on a Saturday. They aren't afraid to wear emblems that might mark them out as being visibly Jewish. On the other hand, when you go into our schools, our synagogues and our cultural centres, you'll see that there's security, that there's barbed wire. And whilst I think the future of the British Jewish community is a positive one and a strong one, 
I'm still nervous because we've seen that the number of attacks are rising. I genuinely believe British values are of tolerance, diversity and respecting everyone. Um, but in practice, I don't think that's always the case. I would love to be able to walk anywhere in my home country and not have to think about how my mere existence will offend someone. And it's really upsetting that I can't do that. Life's getting harder to be a Muslim in Britain. When I started out on this journey, I thought maybe the statistics don't quite capture the full extent of racism in Britain. And seeing the experiences of Richard, Deji and Hannah, I think that's probably true. Numbers don't show just how often individuals get targeted, and they don't reflect the emotional impact of racism either. But it's not just about outspoken racism, it's about subconscious prejudices too. And I include myself in that, because my test results showed that I was capable of holding racist attitudes, even though I'd never deliberately be racist against anyone. See, society has shaped our brains in racist ways, whether we realise it or not. But if we can acknowledge that, then we can change it. And that's a reason to be hopeful. I've been getting away with it all my life.